The following is a presentation from the ninth annual Humanities Days at Montgomery College. The Human in Humanities, Understanding Ourselves and Others. This year, we offered 30 remote events via Zoom. To learn more about Humanities Days at Montgomery College and to access other program recordings, please go to this website. All right, we are now recording. So welcome to the ninth annual Humanities Days at Montgomery College. I'm Nalia Kaya. I'm a sociology professor. Um, I'm usually at Tacoma Park, but obviously we've been virtual a little bit um, for a while. And I'm the host of today's events that you're joining us for, a beating workshop with multidisciplinary indigenous visual artist, Mona Cliff. Super excited. Um, the first thing I would like to do is take a moment to welcome our sponsors. Hopefully you are now seeing our sponsor screen. <laughs> so a big shout out to Student Life, um, especially Ms. Kimberly Jones, the director who helped me go out and buy all the beading kits that we were able to give away to some of you, hopefully most of you. Um, the Paul Peck Humanities Institute, the Global Humanities Institute, special shout out to Professor Barnes, who's also my co-host tonight, um, and also the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Criminal Justice. Shout out to my Dean, um, Dean Benjamin, for also sponsoring this event. Um, and we are going to go to the next one here. All right, so before we get started, I want to take a moment to do a land acknowledgement. If you're not familiar, you're going to be a little form more familiar in just a moment. Um, and this event is being hosted from Maryland on the occupied, unceded, ancestral homelands of the Piscataway Indian Nation, Tayac Territory, Piscataway Kanoi Tribe of Maryland, the Cedarville Band of Piscataway, and the Nacoshtonk people. Um, so I'm just going to take a minute uh, to read an acknowledgement, if everyone will please um, join me. So every community owes its existence and strength to the generations before them around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy into making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to migrate from their homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical in building mutual respect and connections across all barriers of heritage and difference. We believe it is important to create dialogue to honor those that have been historically and systematically disenfranchised. So we acknowledge the truth that is often buried. We're on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people who were among the first in the Western hemisphere. We are on indigenous land that was stolen from the Piscataway people by European colonists. We pay respect to the Piscataway elders and ancestors. So please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us here today together. Land acknowledgements must be followed by action. And so if some of you are wondering what's like a first action that I can take as a settler on occupied and unceded territories, you can look on the screen, um, there is a number you can text. You can text your zip code or you can text your city, comma, and state. Sometimes it'll show up under one and not the other, and it will give you an idea of some of the lands. Um, this is an ongoing project, and so um, sometimes not everybody has been listed yet into that project. There is also a land acknowledgement image you see here of a Padlet. There's a QR code. If you scan that QR code, it will take you to the Padlet, but we will also give you the link at the end of the event with the survey, and you'll be able to go on that Padlet. And that Padlet also has some actions that you can think about, um, such as incorporating um, information into curricula um, about movements, organizations, books, um, and you can also find additional links if you want to find the land you're on, um, not through texting. All right, now to the wonderful part. Um, I'm so, so excited to introduce you to Mona Cliff. Um, so I actually uh, found Mona 
well, I was perusing um, YouTube <laughs> and I was looking for beading um, tutorials and I found Mona's tutorials. And after I made my first piece, I found her um, Instagram and we started chatting. And so I was thinking, wouldn't it be amazing if we could have Mona with us at MC? And so luckily we were able to have her here with us tonight. Um, so Mona Cliff is a transdisciplinary indigenous visual artist. She explores the subjects of contemporary Native American identity and culture through her use of traditional Native crafting methods such as seed bead embroidery, fabric applique. Beadwork and sewing applique have been a primary foundation of her artistic practice. Mona acquired a BFA in printmaking from Cornish College of the Arts in Seattle, Washington, my hometown. Um, honoring Native culture, she has continued to work on her art, combining contemporary subject matters with Indigenous methods of crafting. Her art also focuses on how traditional arts are passed down between generations of women. Mona pursues the concepts of generational knowledge while exploring other topics such as Native futurism and identity. Her beadwork is included in the traveling exhibit, The World of Frida, touring exhibit in the US for the next year. Mona has recently concluded a public art grant through Art Place America and the Lawrence Art Center in which she focused on community public art. Her project Natives Now focuses on bringing visibility to the local native community using portraiture and projections. Mona works as a diversity, equity, and inclusion field representative for indigenous communities for the Kansas Creative Arts Industry Commission. She recently concluded a commissioned installation for the Kansas City Museum, where she is incorporating seed beads as a way to work in harmony and honor nature's forms. She's embarking on a commissioned beaded piece spanning 15 feet. I don't know if y'all can fathom that beads and 15 feet for the Kansas City Airport Terminal. I know I personally would miss my airplane because I'd be living at one percent for the arts program. She will be teaching several classes on beadwork and fiber arts in the near future. And let me tell y'all, you're lucky because this is a busy woman with a lot of commission things and we got squeezed in. Mona is married and has three kids ages 11, 12, and 13. And she is joining us from Lawrence, Kansas. So everybody give a virtual emoji or unmute yourself welcome to Mona. You know, I have to thank the knowledge that that my grandmother gave me. And so this is my way of paying it forward. And if my uh, voice is shaking, it's because I just did a panel today earlier talking about seed beads and um, I joined people in India and we did a panel discussion about the significance of beads in, in history. And, you know, I just have to give all thanks to my, my grandmother for sharing that knowledge with me. And so um, I feel very privileged and honored to be here today. Um, I'm, my name is Hanugane, which means spotted cloud or cloud she is spotted in the Aananan language. And um, I'm enrolled at the Fort Belknap uh, tribe in um, Montana. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest though, and um, my family still lives there, but I uh, came here to Kansas, which is um, Osage, Ka, and Kansas territory. And I came here to go to Haskell Indian Nations University, and I ended up meeting my husband and then getting married up and having kids and staying here and putting roots down here in Lawrence, Kansas, which is a really beautiful place to live. And I'm really enjoying being here. Um, I primarily have been a stay at home mom for the past, uh, since 2009 is when I, when I, um, started to be full-time stay at home mother. And, uh, back in 2018, I decided to go back to my practice, but I wanted to include seed beads because it's, you know, in beading traditions, because that was really kind of what sparked joy for me in, in, in helping me feel connection to, who I am as a person and, and, and bringing that um, really uh, important piece of who I am as a native person and a native woman um, into my practice and kind of sharing that with, with everyone, um, non-natives alike and natives. Um, part of my practice is I'm wanting to uplift native voices wherever um, I'm on a mission to, you know, create public art that where Native people can kind of see who they are and their culture in their cities and where they go. And so I'm very honored to be able to um, 
you know, have art at the airport and share seed beads. Um, so to get started, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, there's so much. I've been doing this since I was, you know, in my 20s um, and dating myself now. It's been 20, 22 years. Um, I'd just like to share briefly this moccasin top that I started making for my daughter. Um, and by the time I had actually finished it, she had already, her feet had already grown too big for it. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I had to abandon it, but this is something that I had started. And just to kind of give you like an idea, um, there's several different techniques to do, you know, to place beads anywhere. And, uh, this technique right here that I've used is, is called lane stitching on one half of it. And then the other half right here toward the border edges right here is called the two needle flat stitch. And this is what I'm going to be showing you right now. We're going to get started with the, the two needle flat stitch. And then if we have time a little bit towards the end of, of this time, I will show you a really quick, I'll give you a really quick introduction to lane stitching. Um, you know, honestly, I've been doing two needle flat stitching for so long, and then I kind of delved into the world of the lane stitching, and I thought, oh, lane stitching, that's going to be so easy, and it turns out it, you know, um, it streamlines the process, but like at the same time, it's very difficult. So uh, yeah, so this is an example of, of beading that I've done in the past. Um, Right here is another example. Um, this is how you can get started if you want to start beading. This is a tearaway stabilizer you can get at any um, hobby store. You can also use this graph paper right here that says, hello. <laughs> These are ways that you can kind of control the designs and how you wanna get started. Um, when you work with beads, you really have to take into consideration like what they want to do too. I know it, it sounds kind of funny, but um, you know, the beads sometimes have a mind of their own. And even though you're trying to control and make make the beads go how you want them to go, you still have to kind of, it's like a negotiation. It's a conversation back and forth. You just, you have to take into consideration what that bead wants to do. So even if you plan it all out to the tiniest, you know, little tiny, perfect, per, per, um, you know, uh, perfect, design, you're still going to have to take into account the different sizes of the beads. Um, there's a practice called culling where you can find um, certain types of beads. So that's, yeah, that's um, that's part of that. This is the beginning part. So I think that we will get started. And what we can do is I'm gonna begin teaching you how to do a rosette. And a rosette is a very simple way. It's how my grandmother taught me how to do beadwork. And we're gonna start with a single bead in, in the middle and we're gonna work our way out and do circle after circle after circle. You know, I've been doing this for a very long time. And so we'll get started by, um, I hope you guys got beeswax, um, but you can do this without the beeswax, but I have a big old lump of beeswax right here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna condition our thread and that also helps the thread. So I'm just gonna take the thread and put it right here on top of this wax and I'm just gonna draw it through. And then that beeswax covers this thread and it helps it not tangle up as you're working because you're going to be passing the thread back and forth on the on the um this felt right here this pelon it's called and i have two long pieces i usually <laughs> i usually just when i measure my thread i just kind of pull it off of the the spool and just you know, depending on what size that I'm doing, um, I don't really measure the thread because I'll show you also how to tie it off and start a new start a new spot. I don't think that's correct terminology, but y'all get what I mean. <laughs> um, so I'm conditioning the second thread and then we're gonna quickly, I will show you quickly how to um, thread your needles that you got. So I think like two or three passes is pretty good. And also really quickly, I have my bead, I have my needles right here. Um, really quickly, I think if you guys have time later on, you can see my beadwork, but I just wanted to share with you, this was my very first piece. I've held on to it for a long time. 
So I think, yeah, 1998 is when I made this. And, you know, we all got to start somewhere and I've been sticking with it. There's just something about the beads that keep bringing me back to it. I just love the process. And so I wanted to share that with you. And a little bread I made for my daughter when she was little tiny, tiny. So, all right. So once I share that with you, we are going to start threading our needles. So if you want to grab the needle, you can try to poke the thread through. But what I found is a really kind of like a really easy way is I pinch the thread between my thumb and my, my uh, pointer finger and I pinch it right down close to the bottom. And then I take the needle and I just pass it over the top of that thread. So Mona, we had a question um, for folks that weren't able to get the exact needles. It's, it looks like an eight, um, a size eight. So they're asking, is, is that a problem? Um, it would be a problem depending on what size beads you have. So if you have beads that are larger, um, it's, so the beading scale is kind of, um, size scale is kind of backwards. The larger the, um, the larger the number, like say 22, actually is the smaller beads. And so if you have like a size eight bead, um, that bead is gonna be a lot larger. And I believe the reason why they do that is how they measure, um, okay. Oh, that's fine. If it's really long, it's okay. You just have to be careful when you're passing it back in through. I saw that, I saw the question or the what she had said. So we're gonna bead two threads right now, or not bead, oh my gosh. Um, we're going to thread two needles. <laughs> that, okay, we're gonna be beading the threads later on. That's, <laughs> um, so I just pinch, 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 pinch the little thread. So I have two needles threaded now with the with the threads. And to tie them off, you're going to want to make a little notch at the end of these of this thread. I just loop it around like this. I loop it around my my finger and then I just bring it through the loop. And that's how you tie it off and you're going to have a pretty big tail. But that's okay. You can clip that later. I usually make two two knots at the end and i clipped the tail off because i'm i'm picky about stuff so um so yeah well, let's get started um i didn't catch that i didn't catch that so um to make things a little bit easier from your guys's viewpoint i'm just using really contrasting colors and um at this point in time because if you're just learning about beading um Making designs is a lot more difficult and I would encourage everybody to just start simply, um, you know, and give yourself small projects that, you know, you can work and get done um, and then work your way up to doing bigger things um, because you don't want to get frustrated. You want to, you don't want to overly frustrate yourself. Um, so what I've done is I just added contrasting colors and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do two rows each of the beading of um, two rows of one color. And so you guys can see the contrasting colors as we go out. And I've chosen the four, four direction colors because uh, that's what I had on my table and they're really nice and contrasting. <laughs> so, <laughs> alrighty. So now that we've got our threads, our needles threaded, make sure you have nice little knots at the end. I have extra thread and I'll show you guys how to tie it off you know, a little bit later once we get down, down, the, down the road. All right, so first bead, we're starting from below. We're starting from underneath. So we are going to come from underneath our pelon and we're gonna draw our needle all the way through. Um, it depends on, the size and what I'm doing and and the type of beading that I'm doing. We're gonna grab one bead. I'll do black 
so it'll be a little bit easier for you guys to see. I grabbed one bead on my needle. And just to show you, I'm gonna drag the bead all the way down to the bottom right here on the pelon, if you can see it. And I'm gonna take my needle and I'm going to poke the needle back through this pelon. And I'm gonna draw the thread all the way out. And as you can see, the thread starting to, and see, you can see now, you don't want your thread to uh, get tangled up and that's what the conditioning, the beeswax is for. So you can see the thread is, is, is coming through, through that pelon and boom, there you go, first bead. So now the bead is secured on this pelon. So that's the very first step. And we are going to start the second step. So I'm coming back, down, back again underneath as close as you can get it, but you have to make sure you give room to the other beads. So I'm gonna bring this needle back from underneath just on the side of this, of this black bead right here. I'm, not, I'm gonna give enough room for the other bead to breathe so that they, you don't wanna crowd the beads. So I'm pulling my thread back through again. I'm pulling it all the way out. So then it's tight. You don't wanna have anything left over on the backside. So once we kind of get further along, you'll understand why. So you're gonna want to make sure that your beads are securely secured and snug on your pelon right here. So I've kind of tightened it a little bit. And now my thread is on this side and I'm gonna grab five, five beads I think will be good. I have hanks of beads right here. I buy all of my beads in, in, in a hank, hank form because that's, it's more economical for me because I, you know, I just go through a lot of beads. Um, and so I'm gonna be beading off the hank. You guys don't have to worry about doing that. Um, it's just something that I do to kind of expedite the process. So this is how we're gonna measure. So I've grabbed probably, can count to them six. So I have seven beads on on this this thread, and I'm going to string them, or I'm going to pull them all the way down so they're close next to this this already secured bead right here. And what I do is I secure this line on my fingers just really quickly, and then I use my thumb to make sure that the these beads are taut and close down to the pelon. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna rotate them using my thumb to keep them in place. I'm gonna rotate this little string of beads around that middle bead. And I'm gonna use my thumb to kind of keep them so I can measure. This is how I'm gonna to measure to know how many beads I can use that I need to use because, you know, beads are all different sizes there's um depending on what type you get the newer forms um the brand um a lot of like the check check seed beads or they're called precocia um they have a lot of different sizes within their own beads even though they're like one size there'll be fat ones and skinny ones and and so that really plays a part in in, in you needing to measure just kind of by by your eye if they're gonna fit. So I'm one bead over. So this is where I'm just gonna kind of keep my thumb here and I'm just gonna drag one bead back off of this, this thread right here. So I'm taking this, this bead off and it turns out I only need six beads. So I'm gonna come back over here and I'm gonna visually measure it again one more time. So I'm just gonna use my thumb to keep them close. And I'm gonna drag it around and it looks like it's gonna fit. So here's the part that we're gonna close this circle up. And you don't have to kind of at this part, you wanna kind of keep keep the beads down, close down here on, on the pelon. Kind of, and you're gonna take this needle and you're gonna pass it through this first bead and it'll become the last bead. 
And when you do that, when you take that needle and you put it through this, this bead right here, the first bead, you're gonna create a circle around that tiny first middle bead. So I'm just gonna hold these beads. I'm gonna see how they're starting to get away from me already. Okay, here we go. Now I'm gonna pull this whole thread and I'm hoping you guys can see this. I'm gonna pull this thread all the way through to make a circle right here. Okay. All right, there we go. Once you kind of mess with it to get it in place. Now that I know my beads are tightly around that middle bead, I'm gonna take this needle and thread and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this needle, I'm gonna pass it through the pellon underneath right here. So I'm coming out the other side now. See how the thread is getting tighter right there. There we go. It's all the way through, it's tight. I've pulled it all the way through and I've kind of pulled it tight so that th these beads are snug. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm taking that same needle and thread and I'm gonna come over two beads from the one that we, so we went through right here. We went back through here for the first one. We're gonna go over, we're gonna skip two over from underneath. We're gonna try to come as close to the thread as possible. And we're bringing the needle back through this pellon back up. We're gonna pull the thread all the way out until there's nothing left over here. We're gonna come, we're gonna, this is where I've kind of come up with this terminology. We're gonna jump the fence. <laughs> so think of this thread that you just went around is a fence. So we're taking this needle and we're gonna hop over that thread into the inside right here. We're just gonna jump over that thread and we're gonna take this needle and we're gonna pull it back through down underneath. And there we go, that's securing the beads in place. And we're gonna go over another two beads and we're gonna come from underneath. We're gonna, uh, you wanna kind of get it closer in cause the kind of the goal of, of doing bead work is you don't want your thread to be showing. Um, so I've come from underneath again, I'm gonna jump over that thread. I'm gonna take this needle and I'm going to poke the needle through the pellon on the inside. And that'll be my, my, my second stitch. And see, sometimes your thread will already wanna start tangling up and you just gotta be aware of that. And honestly, there's really no way to get around that. I mean, I still get my thread caught on stuff. There's been times I've grabbed, like somehow my thread got stuck on my scissors and pulled my scissors in, it's just crazy. So um, right now I can see my thread is already wanting to like kind of get knotted up. And so if that happens, you can also just start, you can condition your thread. You can come back and get your beeswax and you can kind of run it along really quickly like that and it'll condition it and it'll stop it from wanting to knot up. So there's our very first circle and you guys will kind of, it'll be easier to see once we start going out further and further. Um, so to start a new row, we're gonna come out just a little bit further out. You wanna make room to make sure that the beads, you know, have a little bit of breathing, breathing space right there. Um, we're gonna start our second row and this is when we're gonna bring in the second needle. This is, this is where um, I'll show you how to do two needles. Um, so we're going to start a new row and this time I'll do white just so you can see the contrast contrasting. Okay, so um, I have a little pile of beads right here. Sometimes, you know, you'll just need to find different beads so you can pick up the beads like this. If you want to see something really, this is from one of my last projects. I keep 
collecting all of these beads right here. <laughs> so, and this is called bead soup. There's actually a name for it. People have a name for it. And a long time ago, people would make entire projects with this bead soup of all the leftover beads that they had from their old projects. So to start the second row, we're going to, I'm going to use a contrasting color. Just so you guys can see, you can use whatever color you want. And this, every time you go further out, of course, you're just gonna be, so I've pulled the beads all the way down, down below, up, up against this little middle, middle part. Oh, you know what? White is not a really good, oh, that's not gonna help. I'm gonna do yellow, sorry. Let me grab yellow really quick so you guys can really see. So I'm just, this is what's called beading off of the hank. You don't have to worry about doing that, but I just slide these beads right through and I grab a whole bunch. It does take a long time. Sometimes what people do is they have a dish. If they're doing really large projects, they'll take all of their beads off the hank, they'll put them in a little dish, and then people just scoop like this. They'll scoop all their beads onto their thread, their needle and, and pull the thread down. Or pull, um, it helps load the beads on. So going forward, I'm gonna call this the lead thread. So this thread that I have in my left hand is gonna be called the lead thread. And I'm bringing in the second thread and needle. And this is gonna be called my tacking thread. Um, I feel like, yeah, the lead thread is where we load all of our beads up. And the tacking thread is the one that we're going to be using to tack all of these beads onto this piece right here. And tacking is, but what I mean by tacking is jumping the fence. So we're going to jump the fence to tack all of these beads onto this piece right here. Um, and so what's good about doing it this way, and a little, once we kind of get along uh, making a few more rows, I'll show you briefly how you can bead with just one needle. Um, a lot of people do it that way. They find it easier. I like this method because I feel like I have more control, especially when you get into making designs. Um, it really it really helps to have the ability to take beads off if you're counting beads, especially because that's really important part about um, building a design with be beads is you have to something as precise as like making this squares right here. Once you get to making flat lines like this, so you see how these beads are like running like that across, you have to start counting your beads and then also visually measuring the size of your beads so that you can get like a nice straight edge right here. And that takes, you know, a lot of control and so you have to be able to sometimes the beads don't you know they're not the right size or whatever it is you need um so it's important to be able to just have that option to take your beads off of this thread and and grab what you need um so now that i've got these beads loaded up on this lead thread i'm going to wrap this this is just for control too, um, so it keeps my thumb free. I take this thread and I wrap it around my, my fingers, just however is comfortable for you. I mean, you could just pinch it or grab it like this, but your thumb right here, having your thumb free is important because then you're able to control the tension right here between these beads. Because once we start tacking down with the second thread right here, um, it looks thin, but once you start getting in between these beads, these little beads are gonna start shifting just slightly over. You're going to, they're gonna start walking this way. They're gonna to wanna to walk that way. Every time you start, you know, you tack down with this thread. It's thin, but these things are tiny. So um, we're gonna start now tacking these down. So right here, I have this all comfortably in my hand over here on my left hand. If you're right-handed, I guess you'd want to do whatever makes you feel comfortable. 
And I'm using my thumb to keep this tension right here with these beads so that they're not walking this way while I'm tacking. And we're gonna to start to do our first tacks. I start three beads in when I start a new line and you'll see why at the end. So this will be the first bead and it'll be the last bead. So I'm gonna start two beads in. And my rule of thumb when I'm doing this bead, it's also called bead embroidery or two, two needle flat stitch. Um, you wanna tack down every two beads or even if you're doing smaller projects or with smaller beads, you're gonna to wanna to tack down every two beads. Um, but if you have larger beads, you know, sometimes you can go three, some pe sometimes people go four, they're tacking down kind of want to go faster. But if you want your beadwork to be nice and flat, you're going to want to tack down every two beads. So we're going to go three beads in. We're starting from underneath with the second needle, the, the tacking needle and thread is what it's called. And this one's already tied off, I believe. Yeah, I already have a knot at the end of this one. So we're coming three beads in. We're going to try to be as close to the inside of these beads as possible because we're going to want to jump that fence. We're going to want to go over this thread, the lead thread. And I'm pulling this second thread, the tacking thread. I'm pulling it all the way out until it catches on that. Um, it catches on this the knot at the end. So I'm pulling the knot all the way to the to the, the back. So now that we've come all the way through, we're gonna jump the fence, we're gonna go over, we're gonna go on the inside of these beads right here with this needle and thread. So we're jumping over that thread and we're going to the inside. And now we're gonna pull our needle and thread taut in between these beads. So that's the tricky part. Sometimes it'll get caught up, but I hope you can see this. See, my beads already started going awry. So I'm gonna take my needle and there. Now I pulled that tack thread down. This tack thread's back here again, and we're gonna start over. We're gonna do two more beads over. So I'm gonna come over two beads, close as I can in between, in, in between these beads right here. See where that needle's close as it can be in between these two beads right here. I'm pulling this tack thread, the second thread, all the way taut so that it disappears on the back. I'm going to come over the thread again. And now I've gone through the pelon onto the back. And I'm going to pull this thread all the way till it till it disappears at the top. Ta-da. So this is where it's important to be able to have the option to take these beads off because what's gonna happen is when we get to the end, we may not have added enough beads. We might have too many beads. We might not have enough. So we want the option to either add or subtract right here. And that's why it's important to have this open right here and have it, have it out and open so that we can either add or subtract the, the beads that we need and that really um, is an important part that you need to keep in mind once you start building designs with your beads um so yeah i just poked my finger oh my gosh all right so we're gonna do so i even lost count <laughs> let me find where sometimes you have to come and find where where the last time that you came and stitched down <laughs> Back when I was doing this this type of beading all the time, um, I would watch TV shows that I've seen like a billion times. So that way I could listen to what I was, um, you know, keeping my mind occupied, um, but I wouldn't lose track where I was last at, <laughs> where I made my last stitch. <laughs> 
So let's see, we did a stitch here, we did a stitch here. So now we're gonna go two beads over and we're gonna do one stitch over here. And I brought the needle all the way through. You make it taut right here. Um, you don't want your beads to have big spaces in between them. And you also, you know, you don't wanna crowd them either. Cause you can see right here, I don't know if you can see that I kind of crowded my beads at the beginning. So now I, I went over the thread and I'm going back through now with my needle. Right there, you can see it. And I'm just gonna pull it tight again. And right now my thread is behaving. So yeah, let's, I'm just gonna go finish this row right here. So you just go two more beads over. Over the top of that thread, pull your string taut. And I'm kind of walking these beads around this middle circle right here. And uh, sometimes these beads right here in the middle wanna be a little bit wonky and that's all right. Um, you know, especially if you're just starting out, it's okay. The main thing is to just get comfortable putting the beads on the pelon or the fabric or the felt or whatever you wanting to put them on there. Just getting comfortable with that is how you want to start off. And so it looks like I have the right size amount of beads. So I'm going to tack down close to the very end. And then I'll show you how to finish the second row. <clears throat> okay. Sometimes your threads will get like caught up in the back or it might get tangled up front. And, you know, sometimes you just have to go back and, um, maybe I'll do two more rows and I'll, and I'll show you a trick on how to get out of you know, if you kind of messed up a little bit. So here we are, we've tacked down that, that second row and we're at the end of this row now. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this lead thread and I'm gonna run it through that first bead. I'm gonna take this needle and I'm gonna push it through that first bead. So I'm taking this lead thread needle and I'm pushing it through that very first bead. Right here, you see it? And I'm gonna pull this thread all the way through, make sure it's nice and flat. And now I'm gonna take this needle and thread the first one, the lead thread, and I'm gonna finish this row off by taking this needle and thread, the first one, and I'm gonna kind of go on the inside of this row right here. And I'm gonna poke that needle through and that's gonna finish that piece right there. That's gonna finish this, the second row. And see my thread wants to kind of tangle up a little bit. So you just untangle your thread, it's okay. All right, there we go. All righty, so now you have two threads on the back of your piece and it's okay if you change them up, it's all right. Um, sometimes what happens is the lead thread, the tacking thread gets shorter and you have to change that out more often because you're going up and over and you're using more of it and the lead thread will kind of stay longer for a lot longer. So now you have two threads on the back of your, your pelon and we'll start a new row. So I'm just grabbing whichever one and I'm gonna come back here, give a little bit of space for your extra, for your beads. I'll do two rows of yellow so you guys can see, but if you can see, I've kind of brought my needle back up through but I've given some space between 
the needle where I'm starting and these beads right here. And I'm gonna load up my beads with more yellows so you can see the yellow. So you can, it takes a lot longer to just load your beads up doing one by one, but that's okay. I think folks who do really, really large projects, they kind of streamline this process because there's no way of kind of getting around having to load one bead, except for like, like I said, dipping it into a, a whole little bowl of beads. That seems to be the fastest way. All right, so, oh. All right, so now we are on our third row. <clears throat> I've loaded up this lead thread with the beads, get more yellow beads. Um, I think the next row I'll, I'll do red so you can really see see where it's going. Um, so I've I've added a lot more beads and right now I'm just gonna take this thread and I'm gonna, use my thumb and I'm gonna use this thumb to keep them in place, hold them down. And I'm gonna walk it around really quick. See how they're already wanting to pop up like that. I'm gonna walk these beads around to just quickly measure. And I see like I can, what's crazy is that when you start to tack them down, these beads, you know, you might, have uh, no more room, even though you had a gap when you first started. So it's just good to kind of eyeball it real quick. And when you go tack, tack it all down, these are all going to move this way. They're all going to walk that way. So um, leave some room. That's why I don't tack this thread down right away. Um, this lead thread, I don't tack it down um, when I'm making circles, because what happens is these beads will start to walk this way as you're tacking them down. And so I just want to leave room. So we're gonna go three beads in and tack. And once you get this process down, like once you, it's just repeat, rinse and repeat. This is what you do the whole way through. And um, I can show you, I, I think maybe I will show you guys how to build a design. I'll, I'll do a star, um, just the beginnings of it. We have enough time. So as you can see, once you get that, that initial like tacking motion down and you kind of really understand it's really about just repeating and doing the same thing over and over again watching what the beads are doing, making sure that you're keeping enough tension on this lead thread right here. That's why I kind of wrap it and I leave my thumb th free so I can keep these beads nice and close together because you don't want them to get loose because they will want to walk. They don't want to go take a stroll. <laughs> uh, Mona C. I didn't even really intend to have a YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my cousins asked me um, how I got my beadwork so flat and I was like okay I can sit here and type this out for her or I can make a quick video so I made her a quick video and I just kind of gave like a really uh, brief explanation about you know what I do and then I had at the time at the time I had um, you know more people had been asking me beading advice. And so I thought, oh, I'll just put it up on YouTube. And, you know, I did not think anybody would see that, would see that um, channel. I didn't, I think it was just gonna go into YouTube obscurity. Like I didn't think anybody was gonna look at it. And oh my goodness, and all of a sudden everybody started looking at my, at my, at that, uh, at that video. I did not expect it, but it's good because, you know, now there's a lot of people who don't have access to people in their area who have this knowledge and they want to connect, you know, to 
creating items for maybe themselves. That's kind of how I got started. Um, I wanted to make items, you know, for my family and for myself and uh, yeah, that's how I got started. I asked my grandmother, I was in art school and um, feeling a little bit just see right back here, my, my, my thread tangled. So sometimes it will get really tangled up and you just have to kind of go mess with it to get it, to get it untangled again. And if it starts tangling up too much and see how I have a loop le now left over, one of these sides didn't go all the way through. So you just got to kind of mess with it. If it starts to tangle up too, uh, too much, then that's when you can go and um, run the beeswax through, through it again. So I'm gonna I'm gonna run the beeswax through it. That way it doesn't tangle up as much anymore. <clears throat> Actually, I think I'll I'll do the I'll do the design with black because that it'll it seem it'll be a little bit easier for y'all to see. Sorry. Okay, so now I'm coming to the end. And do you see, when I first started out, there was a gap right here. There was probably like this much of a gap at the end. And now, because we've tacked everything down, um, that gap has closed because all of these beads has walked this way. So. All right, so we're gonna close this up again. We're gonna take this lead thread and we're gonna run it through this last bead or the first bead, however you wanna look at it. We're gonna take this needle and run it through this bead, this last bead. Sometimes your bead will, the bead hole will be too small and your needle won't wanna go through because there's already some thread through there and your needle, you'll be struggling. So it's okay if you just want to finish your piece, you don't have to run this needle through that last bead. You can just end your piece right up against that last bead. You can just take this needle and poke it through right up against that edge right there. And that's just fine too um, to finish it. Cause see, you can't even notice. It's just a finished piece now, but you do wanna make sure that you, everything's tacked down. There we go. All right, so we're going to start start a design. This is tricky and it's tricky at the very beginning. Counting your beads and making sure you're starting your design off is, especially with the rosette, is a little bit tricky. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna show you a general, beginning so you can kind of see how how you need to proceed with 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 uh with beads so i'm going to use black and, and yellow <clears throat> i'll do three blacks and three yellows and then we'll keep going and and see if that's going to fit all the way around and to make triangles when you're going in a circle you have to like you know add less and less beads as you go. Three blacks and three yellows. And this is how you build a design. There's resources online um, with, uh, they, they have little graph papers that actually have 
have like designs on there that will help you if that's how you want to start. Um, yeah, you can do that too. Oops. See, I had grabbed too many yellows and so I can just take these ones off. I'm keeping them in my fingers so I can just poke my needle back through them. So I've done three and three and it's kind of funny. I actually just realized um, it's total Halloween colors. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. Like, <laughs> um, it's falls creeping in. Um, so I'm just walking them around again, using my fingers right here to keep the, the beads in place while I kind of visually measure. And when you're creating, um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, creating designs is, is really, uh, you know, it's really a lot of trial and error. Um, there are some places that you can actually get designs to help you. Like they'll have little um, papers that you can bead on top of. Um, if you need, you know, like I had showed you this earlier, this design right here, I can bead directly on top of this. And what I do is I will make a design and then I will sometimes just use a few dabs of glue um, where I'm not going to be, because let me tell you, if you put glue on there, it's so difficult to get your needle through, or you can tack it down with a thread. That's one way to get that design paper onto your, onto your pellon. Um, but I, I just take a, a few dabs of glue, like just a little bit, just to keep it anchored, because once you start beading on top of this paper, um, it won't matter, because you just don't want it shifting around. Anyways, um, so beading on top of the paper, this paper will be underneath your beads forever, which is okay. Using these colors sometimes fills in those gaps. Um, sometimes when you when you're beading without like doing that, you can see right here there's gaps. That is unavoidable. I mean, be glass beads they just kind of take up space the way they want to take up space, um, and that irregular irregularities with the beads, you know. Um, so yeah, you can see this, this gap in between these beads right here. Um, so some people, you know, will color the paper underneath and, and that'll kind of keep those gaps from um, showing. All right. Can so I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, were these beads originally made with seeds? Is that why they're called seed beads? Um, no, I think they just call them seed beads because they're so small. I know oh, okay. one, yeah, ones that are larger, like um, size. So the beads that we're using are size 11 um, and mm. they, they measure the size, the, how many beads they can fit within an inch, I believe. Oh my gosh, don't quote me on that though. So how many beads they can fit in one inch is I believe that's how they, they size the beads. Um, so when you the higher the number of the beads the smaller they're actually going to be so they can get all the way down to size 22 which is like so tiny like it like almost they look like salt you know pep, um, pepper so small like i actually have some if you guys want to wait a second i will go grab some beads and i'll show you the difference between them so these are smaller. This is um, size 18 beads right here, and these are size 11. So if you can see the difference between these two beads, this is a size we're using right now. And these are size, these are 11s, and these are 18s. So they get much smaller. The beads get a lot tinier. My favorite size is 13. And I have some gorgeous beads right here. These are size 13s. And this type of bead right here. So then, oh my gosh, then you start getting into types of beads. Oh my goodness sakes. Um, okay. These are transparent. This is actually like a mishmash. And also it's transparent, but there's also opaque. And then there's also silver lined. And so the ones that you see super shining are silver lined. So that means that they have like a silver lining inside, but they're transparent and it really catches the light. And this is a sandy, what they call a luster. <laughs> and the luster is like a type of finishing that they put on the opaque beads. And it kind of causes like this like satiny finish right here. And then there's another one, like, so I have this size over here and all purple. 
I used for my recent project. This is a purple silver lined, transparent silver lined purple, like a deep, deep amethyst purple. Um, you know, it's just kind of, and then these ones right here are like a metallic bronze. And there's a, a this one is called a Charlotte True Cut. And so as you see me moving this um, against the light right here, you can see that those pieces are catching the light. Um, it's a facet and a facet is just a flattened side of the bead and that's what catches the light. And, and man, these are so beautiful. They just sparkle and, and they're just gorgeous. I, I absolutely love the Charlotte True Cuts. It's, I would use them all. So yeah, right here, these are, um, this is a pink luster and it's a Charlotte True Cut. This is a size 13, so they're a lot smaller. And uh, it has that um, faceted side right here. And sometimes you can get beads that have a really nice big flat faceted side. I will turn those beads so those facets show and they'll catch the light. Okay, back to the beading, sorry. Okay, so now I'm just gonna measure this really quick. I'm not gonna build, I might do tiny, Nice, right on, that's so good to see. All right, so I'm just gonna keep doing three and three and you know what, it might not work out. And so that's the kind of like the, the good part about having this open thread on right here is if you're building a design, it might not fit and you're gonna have to rethink the number of beads that you need to put on there in order to build your design. You might want to follow, follow a, a, um, you might want to follow a design that you've already made, but even then sometimes you kind of have to give yourself some grace um, because the beads are such different sizes. Um, oh, getting back to how they made the beads. And so it's like this really crazy process um, in, I, I believe, Venice was where they kind of um, had perfected this, this, these tiny, tiny beads right here. And originally they would have the, the glass, the, the molten glass, and they would, there'd be two guys that had these like little rods with the glass on each end and they would pull the glass like that and it would be hollow. I don't know how they did it. I've just seen it. And then um, if you've ever seen a bugle bead, like this is a bugle bead right here. It's the, the bugle beads are just not cut beads. I mean, they're just longer, not cut, but they would make these mm -hmm. little rods and then they would cut, cut the rod and that's how you get the seed beads. Um, all right, back to, I totally just realized that it's Halloween, oh my gosh. What day is it? It's a 29th, so what, when Halloween is on Sunday? Yeah, I think oh. so right there <laughs> we could make a totally funny like weird halloween eye if we wanted to <laughs> i was almost thinking like a spider at one point it looked like a leg <laughs> get some bugle beads okay so you see here when i this black part right here this this these these beads right here i've i've i didn't use the right amount Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I watched a video on how they made it. Um, so you you kind of come up on these issues and also it, it fits perfectly around this circle. And so I know that once I start tacking it down, oh, I'm just gonna take these three out. All right, I'm gonna take those three out. I'm gonna tack it down and we'll see where we are at. Sometimes you can fudge the design a little bit. Um, so yeah, we'll just get back to tacking. I mean, really, when it comes down to it, <clears throat> like here, let me show you, I'm just keep using this as an example, but so we're doing a rosette and we're going in circles, but you can really take that line and go in any direction that you need to go. So I made a, a teepee design right here and I just did one long line right here and I did this long line. And then this is all two needle, ta like um, two needle flat stitch. I tacked down this line. 
and you just kind of guide the beads in the direction that you need to go and you tack it down and then they're there forever. But well, we, had a, we had a question. Um, it says, would they cut the rods as they pulled? I'm not sure. Do you mean the buccal beads? I think so. Like, I think that they would pull it and let it dry and then cut it. Okay. And someone um, was saying if they need to do a new thread, should they do a knot at the back or is there something you suggest? Yeah, let me show you really quick. I can show them really quick if you guys want to. Um, if you need to start a new thread, which is often, sometimes depending, let me go through and tack this down really quick and then I'll show you how to start a new thread. Okay, so I've tacked that down and say I've run out of, you know, run out of thread. What you can do is, even with this open, it's all right if this is open right here and you need to tack this thread down um, and tie it off and start anew. You just come back here. And what I do is I take my needle and I just grab a little piece of this pellon. Or even if you can't get, for some reason, the pellons, um, if uh, the pellons, like, I don't know, getting frayed, you can even grab a little piece of the thread nearby and you just take your needle, you kind of grab a piece of that pellon, you can even bend it if you need to grab a little bit of that, pass the needle through, and as you pass it through, you're going to make a loop right here. And so this loop is what you're going to run your needle through and you're going to create a knot. And so when you run your needle through that loop, you just pull that loop and you'll create a knot right there at the end. So there should be a little knot. And if you really want to like make sure it's secure, and especially for people who make regalia, you really, there's a lot of making sure that your beads are very secured on there. Some people, and my grandmother taught me too, she said, you know, you should tie off your stuff um, regularly. So that way, in case anybody needs to come and repair it later on, they can come in and, and not everything's going to just come apart. Um, so make a double knot. So you pass your needle back through again. There's going to be a loop that starts to form right here. See that um, thread is starting to loop right here. You're just going to take your needle and go through that loop and it's gonna create a knot and you just pull that tight and the knot goes right up against here. And if you really wanna make sure it's secure, you can actually just burn a little bit of that thread cause it's like, like kind of plasticky, I guess. Um, and so starting, like if you needed to say, for instance, tie off this lead thread right here, um, like, you know, you just tack it down, do your knot and then start start right up against the, old, the last bead. That's how you tie off the lead thread. I meant how you start, you know, if you if you run out of this thread right here. Okay, so yeah, it looks like, I mean, I'm getting closer to the edge now. Um, I'm just gonna stick. Sometimes what I'll do is if I see that my beads aren't gonna evenly go all the way around, like I have a little tiny gap. Um, usually I can kind of fuss it by, Tacking, you know, tacking down, um, kind of letting the the beads have some room in between them. Um, this is where you kind of get in when you're building a design and you're beading. This is kind of the fussy part. Or I'll pull these beads off, and if I have all of my beads out in a big pile near me, um, I'll go search for. It's called culling. I'll search for the fattest beads to fill the space in, so that way I don't have to go back out. Um, but since we're kind of on that subject, um, backing out of your design is also very easy. And that's, what's awesome about using two needles is right now I'm not, you know, like, um, say I want to find some fatter beads right here so I can fill the rest of the space in and they're already tacked down. That's okay. So what I do is I just start pulling on my lead thread like this and I find that tack thread and then. I will pull that tacking thread back out. So I'm pulling that tack thread right back out again. And the needle will kind of catch down here at the bottom. And if you grab it, you can work it. You can kind of work it, your needle back out and you can just kind of reverse all of your beadwork. That's another little kind of trick 
Um, so then you come back here, you find where the, the area is um, that you tacked and you just pull it up. Sorry, I'm gonna go off screen really quick. Um, mm -hmm. My eyes are getting old. <laughs> so you can, you know, cut it if you want to, to take this thread all the way out. You can also cut this thread, the second, the tacking thread, and then you can just reverse all of those pieces. So it's, you know, it's not all the way on there. Um, but yeah, you can just reverse that piece and then start kind of tack it, re-tack it down if you need to. I'm almost nervous to start the star. I haven't done it yet, but I'm like just adding rows right now because I'm That's scared. That's okay. You, you don't have to. You don't have to. You just do rows. That's you really want to get comfortable with what you're doing now. It, it's okay if you don't want to start. Don't don't worry about it. Um, focus. You know, just focus on just getting those the kind of like that motion of of putting your beads on and tacking because really that's the most important part because everything will just kind of fall in line after that you know everything will will feel more comfortable yeah this is really exciting though because i'm a seamstress so learning beading feels like a good thing to learn like, yeah you know, like beading and lays on my dresses and stuff oh my gosh yeah there is this weird i don't i, I really want to learn um i've seen it on um they they add beads to those really like thin fabrics um, but they do it in a way where the fabric is laid flat and it's it's pulled taut you know like on some kind of frame and they bead from they loop it from underneath they have like this little special equipment and they it's loaded up with beads and then they poke the thing through and then they do this weird looping thing and then they just go on to the next and that's how they get those beads on that fabric. I want to learn how to do that next. Like that's something that I think would just be really awesome to learn. <laughs> I'm just excited to add this skill to my repertoire. <laughs> yeah, it's really useful. And I can just actually, I mean, I, I can just go um I'm gonna do the next line. I'm just gonna do a black black um a whole entire row. Sometimes your your thread will get kind of caught up. All right. So I have a little bit of room and that's kind of like I have room for one more bead. And I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make I'm gonna add one black bead to kind of even it out. So that means that this little piece will be a little bit larger than the rest. Um, that's just kind of how it goes sometimes. Um, you just kind of have to like negotiate with, with the beads. Sometimes they do what you want and sometimes you just have to negotiate. Um, if I was being more careful, I probably, if I had all of my beads laid out right here, I probably would have went and grabbed a bunch of fatter beads to fill in those spaces, but I only have like a few out, so. <clears throat> so now I'm tacking down, so I have my threads and we're gonna start um, with a new row. We'll do a black row. So Mona, what is your favorite thing that you've ever beaded or created? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> um, oh, you know, um, let me think. You know, I really loved making moccasins for my kids. I, I, um, even though I didn't finish that side, I did make, I did eventually make my daughter's moccasins, uh, eventually. Um, my husband has a pair that he wears um, for our ceremonial dances. I just loved making things for my family. Um, the pieces that I did for as a commission for the Kansas City Museum um, were, were an entirely different process. I love 
doing this um, tacking like method. I, I really do enjoy the whole process, but um, sometimes I get a little bit like, I wanna do more <laughs> and so, and go bigger. And, and so those pieces that I did for the museum were like six feet long and I used beeswax. And so I, I really enjoyed that whole process. Um, it wasn't it wasn't sewing like this. It was a whole different process, and had you know, I had a whole bunch of different considerations I had to take into mind. Um, but beading stuff for my family, like uh, I made this medallion for my husband, and you know, I just am really proud of it um, because you know the design elements that I used and the colors and. Um, yeah, like each piece that's, you know, each piece that I do, it's just something new to love about beading and and just beads in general. It's just like I, I keep finding myself coming back to them all the time. Um, I do painting and I do fabric applique. Um, a lot of these skills that I've kind of acquired over the years have been from making uh, ceremonial items for my family um, for ceremonies or social, social um gatherings um you know just ceremonial items and oops, sorry uh yeah it's just a, a lot of the you know and that's what i incorporate into my art now um because i just love the process of it but i also want to push the materials and in kind of into a different realm and see what they'll do Oh, <laughs> sometimes um, if I have a really big project that I need to do, um, I'll thread like 20 needles. I'll sit, I'll sit down for like a couple of hours and I'll thread, I'll make my um, threads probably like a foot or two long so that when I double them up, they're really long. Um, and I'll, I'll thread them and I'll, and I'll get a little thing of beeswax and I'll poke the needle in the beeswax so it'll just sit there. And because the, threading needles, man, it takes a long time. It's really time consuming. So like, I'll get a, like this, I'll stick a piece of beeswax on the wall and then I'll have all of my threaded needles poked into that beeswax and then I can just grab one when I need it. Um, that's how I kind of streamlined that process because stopping and threading your needles seriously like <laughs> it's time consuming and um my eyes aren't that great anymore <laughs> my eyes are i'm getting old eyes now and i actually have like a big magnifying glass just right off of um right off of off screen right here and i've been kind of using that to get um to the seeing the more finer details yeah um even um, now i still struggle I don't know if this will help you, Jane, but um, as a seamstress, usually what I do when I'm really struggling is to lick the thread and then try it again. Yeah, I'll I cut it at an angle, cut it fresh. Yeah. Yeah, that too. Yeah, cut it fresh or, or like cut it kind of at an angle. Um, that's why like the pinching thing kind of works for me. Like I pinch, pinch the thread between my fingers and then it won't go anywhere and then I just try to and that that doesn't always work either it's just it's always kind of a new skill it's actually like literally like I think like a skill that you kind of have to um just take some time you know even now I struggle with it after all this all these years of threading needles and if you ever really just can't thread needles um I used to have a needle threader these little things yeah. that thread the needles for you and those can be really helpful yeah you know so I think I made some kind of like Star Wars emblem. I don't know. If you want me. Okay, so I will. <laughs> I'm going to make an eyeball <laughs> so I can show you guys how to free bead too. So um, to make like a design. Hold on. So what I'm going to do is. I'm gonna make an eyeball in totally Halloween fashion. I'm gonna draw out the eyes and we're going to, and I'm gonna show you how to free bead. I'll show you a few tips and tricks. So I'm gonna draw this eyeball and then we'll fill this part in. 
and maybe do eyelashes. We'll see. <laughs> Make a scary like zombie zombie eye. I love that. Right in time for Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> so now I, I'm just kind of, you know, I'm uh, just kind of going with the flow. I'm seeing this turning out how it is. So you see, I just used a permanent Sharpie. I'm going to finish tacking this down. So that's a rosette. You can take this as far as you want. Like, I mean, if you want to just keep going and going, just keep going and going as far as you, you want to go. Um, beading is really time consuming. And so I think when you're just starting out, um, making sure that you're just getting the basics down. Um, and like I said, start small. Um, so you're not frustrating yourself because you really want to enjoy the process, you know, and for me, I think too, is um, my brain is always going like 20 mile or like, I've got like 20 tabs open. I'm thinking of a thousand things. I'm always, you know, just go, 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 go. And I think that one thing I like about beating is that I'm forced to kind of slow down and um, you can't rush this process no matter, I mean, even if you're really been doing this for a really long time, you still kind of have to go at the pace that you have to go. So yeah. Um, and I think that's what I like about it. I like that I have to take the time to just stop and do it and All right, so we're coming to the end of this last one. It I is. Like oh. Huh? I feel like if I was uh, more experienced, I'd try and turn mine into like a peacock feather because it's like such the right colors and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's got that, like, endless. Stuff going on. So maybe one day I'll try that. Yeah, <laughs> there's endless possibilities. Um, it's kind of why I was just like, well, let's make an eyeball. <laughs> <laughs> let's go there like <laughs> um it just kind of started looking like an eye <laughs> um there's no, just no. endless possibilities and 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 so that's why i'm showing you this free free forming way that you can break out of this circular cycle <laughs> um i'm gonna start on one end right here i am getting close to being done with my tacking thread, but I'm going to start way over here on the outside edge. And I'm going to load my thread up with a bunch of black beads. I don't Love know, it. red might be even scarier. What? <laughs> Sorry, in our comments, um, somebody said beading seems so meditative. And I was thinking of the phrase beading is medicine. Um, yeah. And maybe like, could you share with everyone a little bit about like the meditative aspect and, and what that phrase means yeah i mean um so when i was when my when my grandmother taught me how to bead um she had related that i'm mean, in our traditional way um when you bead because you're especially if you're making something for someone and your intentions are going in into that object that you're making and creating, you know, essentially from nothing, um, you know, you want to have good intentions. You want to have good thoughts. And, and uh, she had always kind of related that, like, um, when you bead, especially if you're doing ceremonial items, um, you want to pray while you're beading. And so there is a lot of, you know, there's some people that, you know, they just, they have, they just make stuff with their beads and that's okay too. Um, but if I'm making stuff for someone and especially if it's ceremonial items, um, my intentions that go along with it need to be um, in a good way. And um, that's kind of how she had taught me um, that I needed to have the um, good intentions behind that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of like when you get into that kind of like a mode um you know you want to have those good thoughts and prayers behind what you're doing because you're you know essentially you're giving that item to that person with all of your energy I mean your energy is going into that 
into that item. And then that person's going to carry that around with them for maybe ever or pass it on like we place a lot of significance on the things that we wear and are on our bodies and and a lot of um within many tribes the objects that we had near us were sacred and they were living things and if you think about that in terms of energy um and and you know people talk about negative energy and positive energy um you know that goes into those objects in a way that's kind of how we believe um, that those that energy goes into those object, objects. And so you want to have good intentions while you're creating them. Yeah, so it, it can be you kind of sometimes when I have even a blank mind, I think that's kind of what goes along with like meditation. But when I have um, big projects, I, you know, I think a lot about my life. Uh, I think about things that, you know, that I'm going through, kind of, you know, how I'm gonna handle it. Um, all those things go go through my mind when I'm when I'm beating. There was so a you big, see, huh? I said there was a big debate during a beating circle about did anybody do angry beating? <laughs> I don't know how you could, but I mean, you could, I guess. I that's that's kind of like a. I notice that when I when I get tired, not just overly tired, but if I, my mind is wandering too much in the wrong direction, I guess um, I wouldn't say wrong direction, but like I notice that um, I'll start poking myself with the needle more. Okay, uh, <laughs> um, I use my index finger on the back part right here as kind of like a guide, um, so that I know where to pull my needle, um, push my needle through. And that's just a habit I've created over the years. Um, Cause what happened was like when a long time ago, when I first started beating, I'd always have to flip it over to see where I was putting my needle in to make sure it was coming out where it needed to come out at, right? Mm -hmm. um, and eventually I got into the habit of, of placing my finger just where it needed to be in order to kind of help me measure, um, I guess, between the two sides. Uh, but then what happens is I start jabbing myself all the time. <laughs> and then I realize like my mind is wandering and I'll poke my finger and my tape, my threads getting tangled. And I'm like, all right, I've got to walk away. I don't know, take a break, like, um, and come back to it and, you know, things will calm down. Um, but it's true. It's kind of like, you know, when you're just getting a little bit too flustered, it's better to just walk away and kind of center yourself again and come back. Because even though it's meditative, it, you know, you still can kind of start getting frustrated with the, the process too. I mean, that is possible. So you don't want that frustration going in. I mean, I guess you could angry be, but <laughs> I just, I don't know. I feel like it would make it harder. <laughs> Because there's been times I'm getting mad and I'm like, oh my gosh. And then I'll just want to leave, you know? <laughs> oh yeah, like yes. Maybe you could feed when you're upset to calm yourself down maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that I could be another like, way too. Like I'm upset and I'm going to do this slow, very like. Yeah, like you could do that too, yeah. for sure. Um. I think uh, yeah, that's the only I saw that I could angry beat or angry so as if I was doing it with the express purpose of calming myself down. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely something that that another way that you can approach it to. I'm coming back. I'm coming down to the very end of this thread now, so I'm going to tie it off and start a new. Um, yeah, because I'm coming down to the end of my tacking thread. Like I still got a lot of my lead thread left, but. Um, so we have a question in the chat, Mona, is beating ever used for a religious practice or like a sacral sacred event? Um, the items that we create, uh, uh, we create items for, for those religious events, uh, um, ceremonial reasons. Um, I don't think that, I mean, like the practice itself, 
um, if you really want to approach it that way can be kind of ceremonial. Um, there's so many different tribes that have a lot of different protocols around how they do things. And so I can't speak for other tribes. Um, I can only kind of relate to you my experience from what I was taught. Um, I did learn from a lot of different beaters throughout these years over the course of many years, um, picking up tips and tricks. Um, you can, I do personally approach my practice as a bead, bead worker, but also an artist. Um, I approach it in kind of a ceremonial way. Like when I come out to my, my studio, um, I light incense, you know, I try to center myself um, to get into that, to get into this mindset of creating because um, a lot of how we see things when we're creating something from nothing, you know, that's coming from somewhere sacred. If you think about it, it's coming from yourself. It's coming from within you, like you are taking and you're making something, this wasn't here just a couple out, you know, like an hour ago. And we created that from nothing. I mean, we put these pieces together. It's like baking, right? Like you take all these ingredients and you create something new because um, that wasn't there before. And so I view that process as being sacred. And um, so I guess you could view the process of actually creating in, um, in a sacred way. Um, a lot of the stuff that we make is for ceremony. Um, a lot of the stuff, that's how I got my start, was making stuff for ceremonies for my family. Um, and so anytime I wanted to to make something for them, I wanted to make sure I was kind of approaching it in a good way and from a good place because I knew that they were going to carry those items with them into a sacred space. And so I wanted to make sure that all of my intentions were good when I was creating that. Um, yeah, so I hope I answered the question. Um, right here, we're coming to this little end. I'm going to tack a few more beads down and then I'll show you how to just tie this, this piece off. Yeah, and you can do fun stuff. Like, um, I just seen somebody the other day, like, uh, bead, uh, oh, what is that artist's name who did Purple Rain? Oh, oh my gosh. Prince. Prince. Oh my gosh. It's like I grew up with Prince and I'm like, what's his name? Like, <laughs> yes, they they beaded a portrait. There's just so many different applications. Um, you know, the regalia that people wear, there's so much time that goes into creating those pieces and those people are carrying those into the, you know, into that dance circle. And so they want to have, you know, um, they're carrying it with good intentions along with the person who had made it for them, had made it with good intentions, you know? So it's important to kind of, you know, make sure that you are approaching it in that manner. All right, we've come to the end and we made an eyeball almost. I'm gonna just tack this lead thread down right here. And I'm gonna just tie this off because we should do that every once in a while. Just gonna make a little tie over here at the end. I'll do I'll do lazy stitch then real quick. I'll show everybody a quick lazy stitch on top of the eyeball. It does go by, especially when you're beating. Oh my gosh. It just okay. So we're gonna do a really quick and I'll do it in red so you guys can see. Um yeah, yeah, for real. I, I usually, some people would ask me like, how long did it take you to make that? I'd be like a whole season of Sopranos or <laughs> the entire album of Led Zeppelin. Like, you know what I mean? I don't know. Yes. Like <laughs> You turn on something and you realize it's on like the fourth season. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, but then like, you know, like I said, I would watch stuff over and over that I've already seen because then I don't want to keep looking up and seeing what's going on, you know? <laughs> yeah you have to have your background shows the ones yeah. that you don't have to pay <laughs> close attention so I'll do a really quick demonstration of um what's called lane stitching or lazy stitch so I just loaded up um sorry I'm gonna count these off in my big old magnifying glass so that's eight I'm gonna do eight so we're gonna do eight 
And this, this, this method is really good for streamlining things. People do it for really big projects. So we're going to load up eight and you can just practice. If you have any room right here, just jump on over. Um, yeah. So just jump on over to the outer edge and we can practice really quick. So I put eight beads on here and that's going to be the number from now on. Um, you just load up your thread and then tack it down. And then you come right next to that where you just tacked it down. You give your um, beads some space and you come right back through from the bottom up. And this is where like, if you're doing long runs of color, like, like how this was right here, this is a long run of one color. This is when beading off of the hank kind of comes in handy because then you can just eyeball it, um, you know, how many beads you need. Eight, you just come back down right next to, you kind of want to give your beads some breathing room. And I will go to town really quick and show you guys how to do this. It's really simple. You just come back up right next, next door. They're neighbors. You just come right at the very top next to these other ones. You pull it down. You want to make sure that your beads have a little bit of space to breathe. Um, that's kind of like the forever um, dilemma about beading is because you want everything to be nice and tight and you want it to be snug so that you're not seeing gaps in between. But you you know you don't want things to be too loose but you don't want it to be too tight because if it's too tight the beads buckle and and that doesn't look very good either um, so this is good for long runs of color that people are doing um, if you're doing really big projects a lot of people use this lane stitching or it's called lazy stitch, but I don't think there's anything lazy about it. It takes a lot of work getting all the pieces right. So <laughs> um, I like lane stitching. Um, that has a nicer ring to it. There we go. Let's just kind of measure it out real quick. Um, some people will uh, draw a line and then just follow the line, tack it down. Yeah, I did want to show this. this is another way to bead. And really quick, uh, so that's lane stitching right here. You saw I just went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, one needle flat stitch is where you have this one needle right here. You load it up with four beads. Um, everybody has a certain amount that they use. You make sure that it's nice and tight right here. Um, you come underneath halfway through those beads. So yeah, uh, load it up with four beads, <clears throat> tack it down. This is one needle flat stitch. Tack that down. Hold on. All right, let's get rid of that. This is a really quick overview of, of these, of how to do this. Um, you tack down those four beads, you come up right in between those four beads, pull it nice and tight. Then you pass the needle back through the last, those last two beads and you start new. You add four more beads on there. See how I'm, I'm bringing those four beads like this right here. I'm gonna tack this one down all the way, make sure it's nice and snug. Come back two beads, pull the needle through, and then you're gonna take that needle and put it back through those last two beads and then start start again. That's how you do need one needle flat stitch. Some people are really fast at this, is how they prefer to bead. Um, you know, you if you if you would rather do it that way, that's a good way to get things, you know, um, just like I said, finding the tension, making sure you're giving the beads enough room to breathe. Uh, you know, so this is one needle flat stitching right here. 
I'm not very good at it. Um, there's also brick stitching, there's peyote stitch. There is so many methods. I mean, if you look up beadwork from South Africa, there's a Yoruba. I don't know how they get all of those beads on those chairs, but it's amazing. Um, there's people who do like a brick stitching uh, in Malaysia, I believe. Um, they make these cradle boards. It's really amazing. The Wichel people down in um, Central uh, Central America, they do a beeswax method where <clears throat> they place the beads on there, but sideways. Um, there's just so many ways to apply seed beads to, to objects, to anything. It's just, you know, whatever you can imagine and however you're willing to learn too. This is just the one way that I've stuck with all these years because how my grandmother taught me and it's the one way I'm most comfortable with. So yeah, that's one needle flat stitching. So you're just coming back through the last two. You're just looping them through. So we kind of made an eye. I mean, still didn't do the bottom, but <laughs> if you want to finish this off, you just bring the needle back through and then tie it off right down here at the bottom. <laughs> And don't be afraid to tear your beadwork back out again. <laughs> it's okay. It's, a, it's amazing how much I've learned in just like this amount of time. Like I'm looking back at the first like row or two I did, and it's so wonky compared to the one that I just did. Yeah, nice. Right on. Yeah, the more you do it, it's all about just attention, you know, and 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 let everything kind of have room to um, breathe. Yeah, so that's that's it. Are we gonna take um questions right now, or did I already answer questions enough? Or does anybody have a question? You can like use the emoji to raise your hand. You can put it in the chat. You could just unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess I can turn the the camera around, and y'all can see what I look like too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can get into that state really quick. <laughs> so we have the question, is there a special sequence of colors that mean things or do you just go by a tradition, favorites? Um, whatever I'm gravitating towards at the time. Um, sometimes I wanna use colors that might be meaningful for someone um, that, that they have an affinity for. Um, there are, you know, just depending on the tribe, there are colors that are significant, um, you know, like red, uh, white, black, and yellow are significant for a number of tribes because those denote like the um, different uh, directions on the medicine wheel. Um, so those are sacred colors for a lot of tribes, but um, there's so many tribes and like so many different, you know, kind of meanings behind why they choose um, when it comes to kind of like personal items um, people just kind of choose what they gravitate towards and what means something to them you know personally like uh, I have an affinity for blues um, it's just kind of my personal you know my personal thing um this is it's really cool because I actually was just on a Zoom panel earlier today about trade beads. Um, and uh, the people I were dis was discussing this history with, they were talking about the beads that they used in India and, and the trade routes that those beads went, where they were made and how they were used. Um, uh, seed beads and trade beads and pony beads came from Europe and they were used in trade. Um, you know, um, for with the tribes as as the uh, tradespeople and the fur trappers had come along, they they traded a lot of different things like metal and um, beads were uh, one of the main things that they they traded for. Um, they usually traded for pelts because of the stuff that we had. They wanted, um, yeah. So that that's kind of you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for asking me to be here. I really enjoyed myself this evening um, teaching. I'm getting better at it. <laughs> Sometimes I might just kind of breeze through something and I'm like, oh yeah, uh, they're just learning. You're a great teacher. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>
that I was drawn to your channel because of like how you taught you you're like you're very happy you're very calm you go at a good pace you and so even when I'm over there getting frustrated you had this calming voice oh. <laughs> that was like just pull the needle through okay <laughs> right on that's so that's good to good to know <laughs> Yeah, I just I I really wasn't um planning on having that channel and I've I've added a few videos, but um the art career has been taking off and so I've been really having to tend to that. Thank you. I appreciate everybody being here, spending time with with me and me being able to teach y'all. <laughs> Well, if everybody wants to, if anybody wants to check out Mona, Mona, what are the best ways? I posted it um, kind of at the beginning, but what are the best ways for them to connect with you and see your work? Instagram, 100%. Um, that's my go-to place. Um, Spotted Cloud on Instagram is my IG page. Um, yeah, that's where you can reach me and, you know, be there if you have any questions I can help answer hopefully <laughs> thank you so so much Mona for being here with us I know you have so many incredible things going on right now and I'm so glad that we caught you right before you go <laughs> off into these big big amazing projects thank you all for attending um, the ninth annual humanities days yeah thank you <laughs> good night <laughs>